Hello and welcome to the IVF Daddies podcast. Today, I'm very honoured and privileged to have Dr. Amy Kang from the Fertility Centres of Orange County. Hello. Hello. Your <laughs> first podcast. Here. It is my first podcast. It's amazing. I'm kind thrilled. Of exciting. I know. I'm thrilled that it's it's with us. <laughs> um, so you are have basically been back and forth from LA to San Francisco. You studied your undergrad at. Stanford, yes. then you did your residency LC UCLA, and then you did your fellowship at UCSF. With you, I would really love to talk about the basics of IVF. What is it? How does it work? But also, before we get into that, something that I've always wondered is, what is residency? What is fellowship? How mm -hmm. does that all work? Yeah, it can get very confusing when you're outside the world of medicine, um, but it's just a lot of different levels of training. So we all go through undergraduate, and then that's usually four years. After that, we go through four years of medical school. And then through medical school, we decide which uh, subspecialty we want to go into, which then leads us into residency, which for different subspecialties can be anywhere from three to nine years. <laughs> and then after residency, which for infertility, we actually start off at OBGYN or obstetrics and gynecology, and that's four years residency. And after that, we do a subspecialty in reproductive endocrinology and infertility, which is another three years. It's a lot of studying. <laughs> it is a lot of studying. Wow. I guess that's where you honed your baking skills because you're a big baker, which I love. I'm like cookies, yum. <laughs> One of the questions that I have is literally is what is IVF? IVF is basically a process of taking eggs and putting it together with sperm in a laboratory setting and developing embryos that we can then grow to a certain stage before we put it back into a uterus. Okay. Because a lot of questions that we have, it's almost, I feel like we always jump straight past that and we go straight into process. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people sometimes struggle with understanding what is what are the basics of, yeah. of that. And I guess to even take it further back, you could say, in general, how, does, how do pregnancies happen, right? The sperm has to find its way through the cervix, the uterus, fallopian tubes to go and find that egg inside the body. Right. And then that egg, once it's fertilized, travels back through the fallopian tubes and lands in the uterus to create a pregnancy. So we're basically bypassing that point in which they're meeting each other inside the body. We're taking the eggs out, we're putting it together with the sperm outside the body, and then we do a process of actually inserting that embryo back into the uterus. So we're just bypassing the need for them to find each other inside the body. Actually, that leads me on to a question. My best friend had an ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. What is that? So that is when the egg and the sperm have met each other inside the body in the fallopian tube, but they haven't transferred themselves all the way into the uterus just yet. And in that process of trying to find their way back into the uterus, it accidentally implanted in the fallopian tube. So ectopics in general are just pregnancies outside of the uterus where they're meant to grow. And so sometimes commonly they're in the fallopian tube, but other times they can be in the abdomen and the ovary. Those are much more rare ones, but that can happen. And that's not good. Not good. They don't have, the uterus is where the pregnancy is supposed to grow. It's where you have the muscles that can stretch out, the blood supply to help support the pregnancy. So in the tube outside the uterus, they're not a great place to grow pregnancies. To me, it's like we spend our entire lives trying not to get pregnant. You know, it's like contraception, don't get pregnant, condoms, mm -hmm. birth control pills. And then all of a sudden it's like the chip change is like, now we're trying to get pregnant and we can't. Mm -hmm. What point do you typically see people and when do they come to you? And so typically these days we see patients when they've already had trouble trying to conceive. So women who are younger than 35 who've been trying for more than a year, women who are older than 35 who've been trying for at least six months and haven't been able to conceive. So most of the time as people start trying, they're talking to their general obstetric and gynecology doctors about how to try, when's the right, right window, all of that. And then once they start having trouble more than six to eight, 12 months without a successful pregnancy, that's usually when we start to see them. And they would be referred to you by their doctor or would they just come to you on their own? That's changing a lot over these past few years. It used to be that the OBGYN doctors would refer them to us, but more and more now with different companies covering egg freezing, things like this, sometimes people are just going straight from their insurance company saying, I want to take care of this benefit and or try to utilize this benefit. 
who do I go see? And they'll refer them directly to us as, as the infertility. Amazing. Person. Amazing. Because yeah. one of the one of the people that we've spoken to in the past was like, I knew nothing about my fertility until I was trying to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Do you find that you're educating a lot of people now at, in their 30s or do you get people in their mm -hmm. 20s coming to you for testing? What yeah. are you seeing? So more and more, which makes me really happy, is I'm seeing people in their late 20s, early 30s that are just thinking about their fertility. They aren't actively trying. They're not technically infertile, but they're trying to plan ahead. And so I'm happy to see those patients because that means whether from their OBGYN, whether from social media, they've started to get an idea about thinking about this before they're even trying. And so then we can go through the whole process of what is fertility when is the right time to think about freezing eggs or trying to conceive? What are the problems that we could run into? So it's a lot more planning ahead now, which is great, but I would love to see more of that. I would love to delve deeper into that. <laughs> so what are some of the plans that you can put in place? Yeah. So I think if in my ideal world, yes, just like sex education, we would have just reproductive education, not just for women, but for men as well, but just to know where do eggs and sperm come from when is the ovary egg bank starting to become a little bit more depleted? How are the things that, how are we able to plan ahead for those things? For the most part, I think that everyone should probably be, get an AMH at some point in their 20s just to get an idea of where they fall along the spectrum of their ovarian reserve. And what is AMH? Yes, so AMH, it stands for anti mullerian hormone, which you do not need to know. Um, <laughs> but AMH is basically a measure of ovarian reserve, and it can be done any time during your menstrual cycle, but can sometimes be a little bit suppressed when you're on birth control. So you can talk to your OBGYN, but what it helps us to assess is where your ovarian reserve is. And if we back up a little bit, what does ovarian reserve even mean? Yeah. Right? <laughs> so as women, we actually make all of the eggs that we ever made in our lifetime in our ovaries before we're even born. And so our ovaries are just like little egg banks from the point that we're born onward, where all of those eggs in the bank are just stored. And then over time, as we go through puberty, as we start to ovulate, those eggs in the egg bank are slowly depleted until eventually when we run out, that's when we go through menopause. And so for everybody, how much we start with in that egg bank is a little bit different. It's kind of genetically determined. And so a great thing would be to figure out where do I currently stand on this ovarian egg bank spectrum? Am I at the average? Am I above or below average? Because that would let us know how urgent is the situation of trying to assess our fertility. To then allow you to plan mm -hmm. what you're going to do. And so you, you said AMH. I mean, how does one test AMH? What is it? A, is it a procedure? Do you, what is it? It's a blood test, just like you would for any routine, taking a look at your lipid panel or your blood count that you can do it at OBGYN, just general visits. So just one blood draw for this test. Okay, and when does it have to be done? No specific time. It can be done fasting, not fasting. It can be done during the early part of your cycle, later in the cycle. So actually, even if you don't have cycles or periods, you can draw the AMH at any point. Oh, wow. Okay, so if you're on birth controls or you have some form of a coil or something like that, you can still do that and it will give you... Okay. It'll give you a starting point. So when you're on birth control, that's non-hormonal, shouldn't affect the AMH at all. If you're on hormonal birth control, then sometimes, depending on the type that you're on and how long you've been on it, it can suppress the AMH a little bit. It doesn't mean that your egg reserve is lower, but it means that, that value may be a little bit falsely lower than it is in reality. And so usually when I see that level is below what I would expect for that age group and someone is on hormonal birth control, then I would advise them to if they really want to get a good assessment of where they currently stand, be off of the birth control pills for about two months minimum before we recheck and see if that level bounces back up. Yeah, to more an accurate stand. number. Mm -hmm. So I'm a guy, I have no idea what mm -hmm. hormonal or non-hormonal birth control pills means. What does that mean? So birth control pills, there's usually ones with combination estrogen and progesterone. Other ones have progesterone only, but all pill forms of birth control have hormones. I guess when you're talking about coil, a lot of that is more IUD related or intrauterine device related, where there's a copper IUD where it has no hormones that helps to protect against pregnancy, but there's also a hormonal IUD. So that would be a progesterone IUD that has hormones. You totally lost me. <laughs> <laughs> Contraception is a whole bigger topic that we can discuss, but yeah. So yeah, contraception is a huge topic and, and we can touch on that. As a doctor talking to a younger you, what would you say? I would say don't feel nervous or worried about advocating for yourself. So it's 
difficult to go in and have that conversation for most about contraception, but it's even harder to ask the question of where is my fertility currently? Because most people don't even know how do I assess that? And AMH isn't necessarily a determinant of your fertility per se, but it is an idea of where your ovarian reserve currently stands. And I would say, ask about it. Go to your OBGYN and ask, I've heard about this thing called AMH. Do you know what that is? Could I get that tested? Because sometimes you do have to be an advocate for yourself. The OBGYN is doing all these things and AMH is not considered something that you should screen everybody for, at least based on our guidelines. And so if you want to know that for yourself, then I would say ask your doctor about it and they should be able to order it for you. I love that. I think one of the things that I always find is whenever I'm seeing my doctor, I'm always like, you're the expert. You're going to tell me what I need to Mm -hmm. know. And I never really push for different things. So I think that advice of advocating for yourself, go in, ask. I always find, actually, if I write it down beforehand, I don't forget. Mm Because I always forget. Because it gets intimidating. You're in the office and you're like, oh, what do I do now? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so I think if if the OBG one says that's not standard practice, mm-hmm. what what then? So not to push any certain brand of anything, but that's actually what this company called Modern Fertility was built around. They're a company that actually allows you to sign up for your own blood test or AMH if you're thinking about your fertility and you can actually just order their test off of Amazon or off of their website. Oh my gosh. And you can go and get it done. The main thing is that you should then talk to your OBGYN or an infertility doctor when you get the results and not freak out by that number. I want you to talk to somebody and not just see that number and worry in isolation. Yeah. But at least you've got the number and then you can go to the doctor and say, hey, I did this test. It's like the home sperm test. I've got this number. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of their whole, the idea behind their whole company was that they want to remove that hurdle of being worried about talking to your doctor about this, worried about them saying no. If you aren't able to or aren't successful asking your doctor about it or you just want a smaller hurdle to get that number you're embarrassed yeah i would say that's an easy place to start and then you can bring that number to your OBGYN or your infertility doctor and say what does this mean can you help me just think about how to plan ahead with this number in mind wouldn't it be amazing if in schools we were taught about these things because it would be amazing yes i wish that we were i wish that we were but i think actually the great thing about social media now things like this podcast things like different instagram accounts is that people are getting the word out there more which is fantastic yeah that's exactly what we're doing mm-hmm. the whole aim of this is to educate people mm-hmm. so i always bring say awareness. to people yeah, yeah bring awareness and i always say that the reason we're doing this is because you go on to any social media and you've got people that are there going through psychology or they're going through legals but very rarely have they been doing fertility we're seeing it more and more and i love that i love empowering people to know about their own body and then as you say to advocate for themselves they've done an amh test Mm -hmm. what then yeah so then i would say it's good to talk to a physician about it there's a difference between quality and quantity of eggs When you are young, the quality of the eggs is high. Usually 35 and older, quality starts to go down little by little each year. And even when you have a low quantity, a lower AMH, I don't want you to be worried. If you're younger, you have high quality, that's mean you have infertility. doesn't automatically mean you're not fertile. But sometimes even having a high AMH, a high quantity with low quality in your later, let's say, 40s, it's still hard to conceive even if you have a lot of eggs. And so quality matters in terms of how fertile you are, but the AMH at least gives you an idea of the urgency of seeking help and seeking preventative measures. So if you're in your 20s and you're doing this, it can give you the ability for a doctor to say, you're, we need to do something or we need to put a plan in place. Yeah, I would say if I saw somebody in their 20s and their AMH was much lower than the average, that's who I'm really looking for, right? Because most of the time the AMH is going to be just fine. And we can just say reassuringly, it looks great. You have more time to plan. And so check again, maybe in a couple of years, no big deal, right? But then when it comes to those who we catch that our AMH are lower than average in their 20s, those are the ones where I'm like, I'm so glad you did this now because we can talk about the importance of egg freezing, how many years it may be till you want to try to conceive, if you've even thought about if you wanted to conceive in the future. Or do you even want to have children? And so at least then you can have that conversation, have an informed decision and not feel like 
down the line when you are actually trying that this all came as a surprise that you actually don't have very high number of eggs you don't have the average number of eggs because i think the toughest conversation i ever have is when you are in the early 30s just trying to conceive and realizing huh my amh is actually very low and the chances of even being successful with something like ivf is not very high and i had no idea coming into this that my expectations were not what the average 33 year old would be or should be and you're like i wish i'd seen you five years ago yeah and there's not a lot we can do at that point there's a few things we can try but when the egg reserve is gone it's gone and there's nothing that we can really do to bring it back at that point Ugh. and that must be really tough conversations to have and mm -hmm. to hear mm -hmm. one thing that i've been hearing again left, right, and center is about ovarian rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. What is that? I think that's like the fountain of youth. It's one of those things where I wish that we had a good treatment to rejuvenate the ovary. I wish that there was a way to bring eggs back when they're not currently there. As far as I know, in terms of the data that's come out in journals and articles that are peer reviewed, there isn't any great treatment to bring eggs back. So when we're talking about rejuvenating the ovary, there are certain treatments out there. You might see things like PRP or other kind of surgeries where we inject basically your own plasma into the ovary to try to get the ovary to produce more eggs. And in general, we haven't seen that's worked out to actually improve people's egg numbers or egg quantity. But when the toughest part is that when you're in that situation, when you've just heard that news, you're grasping for anything that can possibly help you. And so I think it's really hard because there's not a lot that we can offer that is supported by data at this time. And I think that people should keep trying on working on things to see if it works and see if it helps because there's so little that we can offer right now. Um, but I also think that population is very vulnerable when you are hearing for the first time that your reserve isn't as high as you thought it would be. You're grasping at anything that can help. And there's a lot of people out there that will try to utilize that and make you pay for these treatments that are expensive and experimental. And I think that if they're experimental, you shouldn't have to pay for them. They should be under a research protocol. It should be something that it shouldn't be something out of pocket. And, right. mm -hmm. What would you say to somebody at that moment? They've just received this news that mm -hmm. they're 33, their ovarian reserve is not great. Mm -hmm. What would you then suggest? Yeah. And so it all depends on how much of that reserve is left. And so we have a couple of different tests, FSH, estrogen level, to give us an idea of how close to fully menopausal are you. And for everyone, it's a little bit different. But if it seems like there are still some eggs there, we can still try to stimulate the ovary. We can still try to do IVF and retrieve any eggs that are there. And at 33, even if it's one egg, sometimes that's the good one that's going to help you. But if you're at that point where you're fully menopausal, where the hormone levels are showing that there's really just no eggs that are there, then I think it's talking through the psychology of getting over that hurdle of thinking about ovarian or sorry, about egg donation. And that's really that likely thing that's going to be successful down the line. But it's really hard to jump from, I don't have a high reserve to I'm going to use an egg donor. And usually one of the first things I tell patients is that this is a really difficult diagnosis to wrap your head around and it can be very traumatic um, and to talk to somebody about it there are reproductive kind of geared psychologists psychiatrists out there therapists that are very experienced in working with patients who've had to come to terms with these diagnoses it's not an easy thing to come to terms with yourself and it can be cause a lot of depression a lot of mental health issues and so usually that first that next step at the end of the conversation i talk about is is that have have someone talk to talk to about it because it's hard to come to, term, come to terms with it. Do you ever find people in their 20s that are in this situation? I do. It's wow. rare, -er, but it's possible because it all depends on your genetics. And actually, something to ask your mom that might be very helpful is when did your mom go through menopause? It might not be a question that ever came to mind, especially when you're in your 20s, you're not really thinking about it, right? But maternal age of menopause is one of the best predictors for when you might go through menopause. And so asking a simple question to your mom, when did you go through menopause? Was it in your 30s? Was it in your 40s? 52, 50 to 52 in the United States is the average. And so if in the 40s, that would be a little early. And your ovarian egg bank size is genetically determined. And so if your mom went through menopause early, then there's 
a chance that you may as well. And whether it's at the same time they did or even earlier, then that's all a possibility. So again, I'm a man and I don't, <laughs> I've never had a period, but I have a daughter. So if she started her period at age nine, mm -hmm. would she then go into menopause earlier than if she started at, say, 11 or 12? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, because age of menopause has a lot, or sorry, age of when your period comes actually has a lot of different factors. Your weight, how much you're exercising, if you're in athletics, things like that can affect when your period gets started. So not totally related in terms of when your first period is and when you run out of eggs. If you are on birth control, which is stopping you having your period, mm -hmm. does that mean you're not losing those eggs? That's a really great question. And I wish that was the case. I wish that was the case. But even though you're not ovulating those eggs, they're still slowly leaving the egg bank and just going away. So even though they're not getting ovulated, they're not getting released out of the ovary, your ovary still slowly gets rid of these eggs, whether you're on birth control or not. Where do they go? <laughs> That's a good question. They undergo what we call atresia, which is basically the cells just slowly disappear. And then Cells, just like cells anywhere in your body, can just go away if they are not being used. Same thing. So the ovary egg cells, they, if they don't grow, they just disappear. And then the bank size just yeah. reduces, even though you're not leading them. I did once hear somebody asking, and again, it's a very valid question. It's like, mm -hmm. are female human eggs like chicken eggs? Are they, do they have a hard outer shell and then a soft inner shell? And like, In a way, they have something called the zona pellucida, which is the shell that's around the egg itself. And that protects it. Mm -hmm. A great friend of mine is a transgender woman. Mm -hmm. What is your experience in dealing with trans people and what do they need to plan? Because I think that's something that is also rarely touched upon. Yeah. And so it all depends on when it is that they started to discover they are having a little bit of dysphoria about the gender identity, if at a very young age, and they're thinking about maybe trying to transition even before puberty, then that is a totally different story than if they have already gone through puberty and they're transitioning after. And so when it comes to fertility, whether it's the eggs or the sperm, they're affected by the hormonal treatments and things that you would be on to transition. And so most of the time when you're on hormonal therapy, whether it is testosterone or estrogen, it would suppress for the testosterone, it would suppress your regular ovulation. For the estrogen, it would suppress your production of sperm. And so for most, you would want to consider, I think, freezing sperm perhaps before starting the estrogen therapy that would suppress the production. And if you didn't think about freezing sperm beforehand, because that was just not even on your mind at the time, then ideally you would need to be off of the estrogen therapy for a period of time to see if that sperm production sort of rebounds in order to try to collect so them. Freeze that. Mm -hmm. So you said two things, one pre-puberty, one post-puberty. Mm -hmm. I guess that means that puberty is when you start producing sperm and releasing eggs. So right. That's why. Right. And so puberty is when um, the testosterone production would start from the testes and when estrogen production would start from the ovaries. And actually before puberty, if you're thinking about transitioning, there's not a lot of options for freezing things because you're not even really producing sperm just yet and you're not really producing eggs just yet. You're not ovulating. And so the usual methods that we think about for freezing eggs, freezing sperm before puberty, you would actually not have a lot of those options. You actually would either freeze ovarian tissue or freeze sperm testicular tissue in order to try to then mature those Make gametes. Sure later on, which is something that isn't very well studied just yet. And so it's actually really difficult when you're making that decision before puberty. It's a big discussion to have mm -hmm. because there's not a lot of great ways to preserve fertility if you're transitioning before puberty. That's worth a whole podcast in, in and of itself. It's such a huge topic. When you are freezing eggs and freezing sperm, mm -hmm. do you find that age is a factor? in success yes especially for eggs and so the number of eggs is really important when we're talking about freezing because there is some attrition when you freeze when you thaw 
there are some eggs that don't make it because the eggs and sperm, they're just single cell organisms, they're very tiny. And so some of them don't survive that freeze thaw process. And so for the eggs, it's very important, the quality of the eggs and the number of the eggs that are frozen in terms of your likelihood of having a successful pregnancy after the fact when you're trying to thaw and fertilize them. For the sperm, I would say age matters, maybe 40 and older, because at that point, there usually is just a natural sort of decrease in the number of the sperm as well as the modal sperm, the moving sperm. And so if freezing, I would consider it prior to that time point. Amazing. Dr. Kang, you are a wealth of knowledge, <laughs> and, and thank you so much for being on this podcast all first. Thank you for I'm very having excited. me. Very excited. Yeah, now I won't say that it's my first podcast ever anymore. This is great. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank we'll you. We'll talk to you very soon. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.